All right, there we go. That's great. And, uh, and if it works, we'll put it up on YouTube so you can live through the torture a second time. So uh, it's really great to have you all back here after, it's been a month since we've been together. And, uh, and in these early Sundays of January, because you know no one's around to tell you what to do, you kind of get to pick your own stuff. And, um, and so I decided I'd like to talk this evening about living our life on purpose. Dirk and I have a mutual friend. He's an atheist who goes around bugging every Christian he can find, asking for proof of God's existence or historical proof that Jesus ever lived. And, uh, and he, he talks to, you know, uh, college professors and he talks to pastors and he talks to people like Dirk and I. Um, how he ever finds time to actually do a day's work, I really don't know. <laughs> so I don't know why he's spending his life trying to prove that God does not exist. Because if I truly believed that God did not exist, I wouldn't waste another minute of the only life I'm ever going to have talking about the subject. But anyway, each man to himself. <clears throat> now, he's not a good advertisement for how atheism sets you free to pursue your own personal happiness because I am far more happier and more content than he is and I'm not just branding, it's just clearly a reality because I'm not going around bugging other people who claim to be atheists, so, you know, one of us is happier. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do feel sorry for atheists because if there is no God, then there is no ultimate meaning or purpose in life. We are here by accident, and another accident could come along and wipe us out tomorrow. Right? There's no ultimate meaning and purpose. Ultimately, life is irrational, because if no rational forces were employed in bringing us into existence, then there is nothing rational about this world. There's nothing rational about life. And it doesn't even bear thinking about, really. If life is purposeless and meaningless, it's also hopeless. You see, the dictionary definition of hope is wanting something good to happen and having a good reason to think that it might. If you're an, if you're an atheist, you don't have a good reason to think that it might. The Christian era believes that we, were, that we were created and that there is a reason for our existence. Everything you have ever made, you've all made stuff, right? Some of it you made in primary school and you're still trying to hide it, but it's kind of in the, in the back of the cupboard somewhere. But everything you ever made, you made for a reason. It was meant to serve some purpose, even if it was just to be a decoration or a picture on the wall. And it's the same with our Creator God. Everything He made has a purpose. So what is our purpose? Why did He make you and me? And you know, we don't have to go searching high and low to find our big purpose. God has already told us what it is. We already have all the big pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. And if you follow God's purposes for your life, then God and His sovereignty will make sure that all the small pieces of the jigsaw puzzle fall into place as well. So let's take a look at the big pieces of the jigsaw puzzle tonight. And none of this is going to be big news to any of you, but let's consider again what those big pieces of the puzzle are. So, the three purposes of every Christian. And uh, tonight is brought to you by the number three. <laughs> Because I've got three points and three sub-points under each point. All right. So I believe that there are three big pieces of purpose that God intends for every Christian. Do you think you can remember three things? Because I'll do a little test at the end to make sure that you remember that. Okay? Here's the first point. The first purpose. Our first purpose is to love God with everything we have. 
Mark 12, 30, and Jesus is just basically condensing all of the law and prophets and says that they can be condensed into two rules. Here's the first one. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's our first purpose. Our first purpose is to love God with everything we have. So let's talk about that. And hey, there are three little points under this point. Right? And here's the first one. Our spiritual life is rooted in time spent with Jesus. You know, when Jesus called his disciples, we could argue he recruited them to a cause, he put them through a training course, he briefed them on their mission, and then he sent them into the world. That would sound quite kind of corporate wouldn't it? And we could talk about it like that, but we'd be missing 99% of what was really going on. You see, Jesus called his disciples to follow him, to be with him, to get to know him, to grow to love him. And for three years, everything Jesus did was observed by a small, intimate group of people. And they discovered what it was like to be observed by Jesus, too. Right. There's no hiding from Jesus. A relationship with the person of Jesus is the start of our spiritual journey. And without that relationship, we don't have a spiritual life at all. We may have spiritual thoughts. We may have spiritual longings. We may have spiritual beliefs. But without Jesus, the source of our life, we don't have a spiritual life. Loving God with everything we have, all of our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, it implies a kind of a devotion and dedication that of pressing into Him with a hunger to know Him much, much more, to know Him as deeply as we possibly can. We have a hunger that says, that never says, it's enough. Maybe I don't feel like that right now. And maybe you don't either. But the question isn't really if you're feeling it. It's whether you're making it a priority in your life. You see, when we fall in love, we have endorphins and all sorts of other chemicals floating around inside of us that give us those warm, glowy feelings. Those kinds of feelings are a little harder to come by with someone that you can't see or touch. So we have to start from a place of faith rather than feelings. And our foundation is our assurance that we have been saved and that Jesus lives inside of us. And if you don't know if that's true for you, then please come speak to me or Lynette or any one of the other leaders around here afterwards and we'd love to chat to you about that. But building on this foundation, I choose to spend regular time with Jesus through reading the Bible, through prayer, through reflection and meditation through my day. And the crazy thing is, the more I do it, the more I want to do it. And yes, sooner or later, feelings do follow that faith. If I'm not getting to it, if I'm not doing it, then I need to deal with whatever it is that's pushing out my time alone with Jesus. For me, it's all the stuff going on in the world. The first thing I do in the morning is, well, it's visit the bathroom, but that's probably true for most people. <laughs> and then, while I'm still sitting there, <laughs> I check on my news apps, all right? And I check the BBC, and I check CNN, and I check all sorts of places to see what's going on in the world. And then, you know, that leads to a little another rabbit trail because then I see another heading and it's like, ooh, that looks interesting. And, and next thing I know, most of the time that I had set aside to have my quiet time has gone in really interesting stuff, but not important stuff. <laughs> or sometimes I've, I've just left so little time, I have to rush it. I've got to rush my quiet time because there's something I've got to get to. And instead of just enjoying my time alone with God, it was a rush. And I didn't really get from it all that Jesus had intended me to, to get from it that day. No one else can change that situation for me. 
I need to deal with it myself. I can't help you with your problem. You're going to have to deal with that yourself. In Luke 10, Jesus visits the home of his friends Lazarus, Lazarus, Martha. Lazarus doesn't seem like a right word tonight somehow. <laughs> Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. Lazarus isn't mentioned in the story in this particular instance, but Martha is scurrying around, preparing food, laying the table, and she's really getting annoyed that Mary is just sitting there, sitting at Jesus' feet, just spending intimate time with him, listening to him. And when she reprimands Jesus for letting Mary get away with making Martha do all the work, Jesus says this to her, My dear Martha, my dear Howard, you are worried and upset over all those details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. And Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Yes, there's lots of stuff coming at us. Lots of stuff to grab our attention, to fill our thoughts, to worry us and concern us. But sitting at Jesus' feet, that's the only thing worth being concerned about. And if we've discovered it, Jesus doesn't want anyone to take that away from us. So through time spent with Jesus, we discover the ways of Jesus. You'll know we're on point two of the first point now. This is what the Apostle John says at the beginning of 1 John. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands, and he is the word of life. And this is what John is saying. This Jesus we're telling you about, we know what we're talking about. We walked with him, we talked with him, we could touch him. We are qualified to tell you about the ways of Jesus because we spend long, personal time with him. And that's why reading the Bible is so important. Because the heart and the ways of Father God and Jesus His Son are revealed to us through people with first-hand experience. They were there. They felt Him. They touched Him. They lived with Him. They experienced Him. They knew Him. They knew His ways. You know, the more time you spend with Jesus, the easier it is to answer the question, what would Jesus do? If you're not spending time with Jesus, the answer to that question is not so clear. But when you've been with Jesus and you know his ways, the answer to that question becomes easier and easier. And then discovering the ways of Jesus changes our life priorities. In Luke chapter 19, we have the story of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is, is, a, is, a, is a short guy like me. Uh, he's a short little tax collector. And he's working in Jericho, and he's got a lot of friends of the dubious kind. And he's really curious, and he's dying to see Jesus, this miracle worker that everyone's talking about. So when he learns that Jesus was passing by, he shims up a tree to get a better view, and along comes Jesus. And Jesus looks up into the tree. There's this awkward moment as their eyes rock. And Jesus says, come on down. I'm coming to your house, and you know, we're going to have a meal. And so Jesus is like, all right. So, he just calls a party. He gets all his friends around. They have a rollicking good time. And he and Jesus are just having this great old chat. And the interesting thing is, is that as the conversation goes on, he just starts getting this little conviction about what it is that he needs to do. And when that conviction gets overwhelming, he jumps up to say, you know, I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor. And if I've ever cheated anyone, I'm going to give them four times back. Being with Jesus changed the priorities of his life. You know, the only reason any Jew collaborated with the hated Roman government was to get rich. There had to be some big incentives to make up for all the hate and the exclusion that you got from your own people being a tax collector. Zacchaeus suddenly has new priorities in his life. He wants to be God-honoring. He wants to take care of the poor. He wants to be an honest man, doing an honest day's work. When we spend time with Jesus, we discover the ways of Jesus, and he resets the priorities of our life. Okay, that's our first big purpose. 
to love God with everything we have. Here's the second one, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And so, yeah, it just continues into verse 31. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these, says Jesus. So, what does it mean for us to love our neighbors like we love ourselves? Well, it just happens Jesus told another story to illustrate this point. So there's a Jewish man who takes a road <laughs> notorious for bandits and holdups, and would you believe it, he gets mugged and robbed and he's left for dead, all beaten up and bleeding on the side of the road. And two of his kinsmen walk by and both decide, for reasons of their own, not to deal with the yuckiness and to just keep moving. I think you or me, you know, passing a drunk who's peed his pants and you can see a pool of vomit nearby and now he's unconscious to the world, and, you know, what would I do? What would you do? Deal with the yuckiness or just move on by? I don't think I've ever stopped just saying myself. But then along comes a hated Samaritan. And why is he hated? Because he holds the wrong beliefs. They don't fit with the orthodox Judaistic view. He's a heretic and a second-class citizen. He doesn't believe the right stuff like us. But when he sees the situation, he does what he can to help. Hang the expense. Hang the inconvenience. He gives the beaten-up Jewish man his time, his wine, his oil, his donkey to transport him, and he pays for him to be looked after while he recovers at a wayside inn. Then Jesus asks, so uh, who in the story loved his neighbor? Duh. Yeah. The answer is obvious, and everyone was squirming, and they had to go. They couldn't say the Samaritan. They had to say the person who did good to him. So when we have spent personal time with Jesus, and we've discovered the ways of Jesus, and we've seen our life priorities change, we're getting equipped to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And here are three things we can learn from this story about loving our neighbors. And here's my first sub-point, and point two. We get to show compassion and forgiveness. Compassion is recognizing someone's suffering and choosing to do something about it. It's not about whether you're feeling all touched about it. It's our actions, not our feelings, that count. And you know, that's the hardest to show compassion when the person in need has done you wrong. Your own hurt can blind you to their hurt. The Samaritan man was looking down on a man who would never speak to him, who might spit on him, and who would certainly believe the worst about him. To show compassion to the man, he had to let all of that go. And you know, we need to be compassionate at the beginning because Jesus has some pretty tough words for us in Luke 6. You must be compassionate just as your Father is compassionate. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. Are you stuck with someone? Are you lacking compassion or forgiveness? Ask for God's help, then lead with action rather than your feelings. And you may be surprised how feelings will follow. The second point is we need to practice hospitality. You see, how can I truly love my neighbor without seeking to have a relationship with him? with him or with her. What's the big picture here? I'm dreaming that one day they'll become part of God's family and that we'll be brothers and sisters in Christ. And hospitality is the scriptural, time-honored bridge to relationship with people. And that's why we start every Sunday with a meal too. So we can invite our friends here and we can break bread together. And we can begin a relationship that may lead to them meeting Jesus. We live in a little uh, townhouse, I hardly know what to call it, we're down a right of way, and there are nine other houses down our right of way. And uh, Lynn, Lynn and I are kind of like, you know, camp, camp parents for all the other houses down the right of way. <laughs> in 
a sense. We've lived there the longest, and we've been very intentional about getting to know all of our neighbors. And so once a year, we do a big cleanup of our driveway, but on several other occasions in the year, we just invite them around for coffee and a chat, and just about everyone comes. And everyone has got to know each other. It's a really comfortable neighborhood now because all the neighbors know each other, and they've spent hours chatting with each other around our table drinking our coffee. But that's a small price to pay because hospitality is how we get into their lives, how they start telling us about their problems, how they start hearing about church and church one, one to six and about our faith. And because of those conversations, um, you know, Tupu came into my life because the neighbor said to him, hey, these guys are good guys and I think you're looking for someone and why don't you just hook up with Howard? And so, you know, um, I got Tupu in my life. And so that's kind of how God works. Scripture promises that one day we'll be coming home to Father God forever. Secure in God's hospitality towards me, I can choose to be a safe place to welcome friends and maybe broken and hurting without being threatened by their stuff. God's got us, and because God's got us in his arms, we can, we have the, the courage and the strength to grab other people as well. And then thirdly, we need to want God's best for our neighbor. What's the most loving thing that anybody's ever done for you? Gave me a car. Gave me a car? <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm just not feeling that love right now. But I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> Twice that's happened. <laughs> That's great. You know, if you've come to faith, the most loving thing someone has ever done for you is introduce you to Jesus. I was only four years old when my parents came to faith. So being introduced to Jesus was very easy and natural for me. But your story may be different. You may have resented the person at first who forced you to confront your relationship with God. You may have been kicking and screaming about it until the moment you gave in to the love of Jesus. So there are people here who know what I'm talking about. And the same may be true for the people God brings across your path. You know what God's best is for them, but they may not think they want it. But you need to gently and courageously go there anyway. Truly loving my neighbor means seeking God's best for them. You need to earn the right to speak into their lives, but when you've demonstrated your heart of compassion and forgiveness and your hospitality, you may need to gently confront them about blind spots, about wrong thinking, or about destructive behaviors, and you need to point them to Jesus. We're on to my third point. Kalu Kalei, or practice days, is it? Well? <laughs> the third purpose. The third big purpose of every Christian is to be a part of God's plan for the world. Ephesians 1, 9 to 10 says this. God has now revealed to us, and I've put in brackets the church because in the context that's what he means here, his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan being revealed. At the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. You see, God has a plan. It's a very big plan. And the plan is to bring everything in the entire, everything in the entire cosmos together, everything in heaven and on earth, under the lordship of Jesus Christ. The plan is too big for us to fully understand, and it requires God doing God's stuff that only he can do. He doesn't have to tell us all about it because we wouldn't even understand, but God's got it, and he's got this other stuff that he's doing. But he invites us to join him in his mission, to, co to cooperate with him in making his plan real. And there's a horizontal and a vertical dimension to his plan. And I just went vertical and horizontal the wrong way, but... <laughs> 
There's a horizontal and a vertical dimension to his plan, and both require reconciliation. The horizontal dimension is this. God is going to bring the whole world together. He's going to bring everything together. And what does that mean? It means unity rather than division. Peace rather than strife. Love rather than fear. And the vertical dimension is this. Everything is going to come under the authority or lordship of Jesus Christ. And you can't choose just one dimension of that plan. You've got to embrace them both. Right now, there are all sorts of people running around, ambassadors and envoys, trying to stop people fighting and killing each other. But the kind of peace that they can secure will never last. There's no possibility of lasting horizontal reconciliation without submitting to the vertical, submitting to the Lordship of Christ. Because we come together, to come together, we need a common cause and a common purpose. Two Corinthians five says, "For God gave us, and again I put the church in there, this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors." God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ and we plead, come back to God. We get to be a part of God's plan for the world. We are God's ambassadors. He's agents of reconciliation. So, how do we do that? How do we do all of this? Well, I happen to have three small subpoints to explain <laughs> how we do this. And here we go. To be a part of God's plan for the world. Number one. We need to link in with God's church. The Christian's purpose of glorifying God in the world is not ours to live out alone. God's mission is much bigger than any one individual can do alone. That is why God entrusted his mission to the church. A Christian who is going it alone and is not linked in with the church family is missing a big piece of God's purpose for their lives. Because God has given us special gifts for the benefit of the church body. And if we're not there, the church body can't benefit from them. We miss out two ways. We miss out on the opportunity to minister to, and we miss out on the opportunity to minister to others. Each of us are God's gift to the family. And the family is God's gift to each of us. Hey. <laughs> We all need flesh and blood people to disciple us, to encourage us, to stand alongside us with strengths and giftings that can complement ours. You know, it's the whole family of God shining out of the world that looks like a city on the hill that cannot be hidden. We together are a foretaste of the kingdom which is to come. One to six should be a kingdom hotspot where outsiders can come in and see God's grace and power at work amongst us. Okay, my second point. Ooh, if you're tracking with me, you'll know that we're nearly there. We need to join in with a God of endless possibility. So, we're not doing mission on our own. It's not all up to us. It's all up to God. So, we can be certain that one day we're gonna, it's going to be mission accomplished. It's going to be great. But it's really easy to get stuck looking at all the problems in the world, thinking... There's just no solution to all of this. There's no way anything can change about this situation. But God doesn't see it the same way. Because ours is a God of endless possibility. He's constantly doing new things. Listen to this verse from Isaiah 43. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. You see, things can seem stuck to us, but God can make a pathway where no one thought a pathway was possible, and he can do it at any time he chooses. In fact, he does it all the time. Lamentations 3 it tells us that God's mercies begin fresh every morning. Every day with God is a fresh act of love, a fresh outpouring of his grace, a new day of possibilities. And one of the ways we, we harness the endless possibilities of the heart of God is through prayer. Listen to these incredible words from John, John for 14. I mean, I'm almost scared to read them because, because people might say, oh really? But, but Jesus said this, 
And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now that's an incredible, breathtaking promise. And I can't explain exactly what Jesus meant there, because I've prayed, prayed plenty of prayers that I don't think got answered straight away, but you know what I mean? Talk to Murray about this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> but what I do take away from this is that Jesus will do anything to glorify the Father. And if he can do so by answering our prayer, he is more than eager to do so. If he can glorify God through answering our prayer, he is more than eager to do so. He can make a pathway through any wilderness. We just need to ask. And then we need to tune in to the need around us. We live in a world of sensory and information overload. Stuff comes at us from every side, from every angle, and it's overwhelming, it's exhausting, and so we tune out. And there's stuff going on that we feel powerless to fix. There are wars and famine and drought and political instability around the world which don't directly seem to touch us, and so we, we just let it slip by. When last did you or I earnestly pray about these issues? Do we believe God can change things? And then there are the needs closer to home, right here on Point Chef. We look around and what we see is homelessness and addiction and crime and loneliness and sewage running to the sea and unaffordability of housing. And as Kiwis, you know, we moan about the government and the council and the welfare system, imagining that one day somehow they're all going to sort it out. They're not going to sort it out. We need to tune in to the needs around us. And then as a church, we need to pray about them. We need to ask God to intervene and to be available for God to use us as a local kingdom hotspot. Right? Amen? Amen. Amen. So, in closing, are there other pieces to that purpose puzzle? You see, I said at the beginning that the three big purposes of God that we have covered tonight were the big pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, and if you get these right, all the smaller pieces will fall into place too. Okay, who can name the three big pieces of the puzzle? I told you there'd be an exam here. Yes. What are the three big pieces of the puzzle, people? Love yes. God. Sorry? Love God. Love God. Just love God. Yes. With everything we have. <laughs> and the second one was no, 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 no. love your neighbor as you, as you love yourself. And the third one? All right. Very good. Now many many Christians spend a lot of time worrying about discovering God's special, unique purpose for their lives. And this is a big big topic with a sermon in itself. But my advice to them would be to get off the couch and get on with their lives. You see, God may have a special plan for your life, but he doesn't promise that he'll reveal it to you. What God has done, he has planted certain godly, honorable desires in your heart already. There's stuff you already care about. There's stuff you are really good at. Get on and do those things. And if God ever wants to change the direction of your life, He'll let you know. Colossians 3, 23 and 24 says this. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. So whatever you do is fine with God as long as he's glorified through it. Just carry on, people. <laughs> Joseph. One of the twelve sons of Jacob went from being a bit of a brat and a shepherd to being a slave and then a personal assistant and then a prisoner and then a trusted assistant again. And then he became the two I see of Egypt. He went from being a nobody to someone who saved many thousands of lives that would have been lost in the famine. And he saved the nation of Israel too. And at no point along the journey did he know what was coming next. All he did was apply the principle of Colossians 3. Work willingly at whatever you do as though you're working for the Lord. And God took care of the rest. Let's pray. 
Dear Lord, I thank you for this opportunity just to consider, Lord, what it is that we are grounded in, what, what our purpose is as Christians. Lord, and all of this is basic stuff, and we've heard it all, all before. But I pray, Lord, as we just step into 2024, Lord, that you'll just make this real for us, bind us together as a family, and pray, Lord, that our love for you will just grow and grow this year. Uh, and uh, for those of us for whom this is very much in the head, but not yet in the heart, I pray you'll just make this real and lived experience for us this year. Amen. 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 I've got a question for your tables. And here it is. What are practical ways we can show God's love in everyday life? So talk about this at your table. <coughs> 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 